What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Welcome back to What The Fitness. You know what time it is. Like, comment, subscribe for Al Gore. What do we have this week? We have somebody who is becoming a regular guest now on What The Fitness. And that is our good friend, Dana White's own personal longevity guru, Gary Brecka. Let's see what Gary has to say about LDL cholesterol. I'm sure it is gonna be right in line with all the scientific literature and he's not gonna embellish, exaggerate, or misrepresent claims at all. Here's the myth about cholesterol, guys. I mean, I'll tell you this right now. Cholesterol is the most maligned and misunderstood compound in the entire human body. Actually, it's one of the most studied compounds in the human body with tens of thousands of published research data. I don't know how you can malign a compound also. Can you just imagine poor little cholesterol sitting in the corner? Why doesn't anyone want to be friends with me? <laughs> I'm involved in the plasma membrane. I hope with membrane fluidity. Why do you not love me? <laughs> Poor cholesterol. Right? We have been taught that high cholesterol leads to cardiovascular disease, and that's not true. There's no published evidence anywhere in the peer-reviewed clinical literature linking elevated levels of LDL cholesterol on their own to cardiovascular disease. <laughs> okay. So, hmm, hmm. you use this word linking. I don't think it means what you think it means. There are mountains of evidence linking cholesterol to cardiovascular disease. Now, linking and associations are not sufficient to establish causation. However, one of the difficulties we have with understanding disease is that you cannot do 20 year randomized control trials. And when it comes to something like heart disease, for example, if you did, let's say a randomized control trial of low saturated fat versus high saturated fat, producing different levels of cholesterol in people, and you did that for two years or even five years, and you did it in people in their 40s or 50s, it's still gonna be really hard to see differences between groups. And the reason is heart disease is a lifetime exposure risk. The amount of LDL cholesterol you're exposed to during your entire life is gonna be one of the determining factors along with genetics, which is probably much more powerful to be honest, but part of that genetic risk is how much LDL cholesterol you naturally secrete. When it's a lifetime exposure risk, you really have to look out over 10, 20, 30 years. Oh, by the way, a two-year randomized control trial, extremely expensive, extremely hard to get the funding for, extremely hard to execute. So they don't really exist that much other than a scant few. And they don't really show differences. And so people have used that and say, ah, see, this doesn't make a difference. Let me give you an example, a financial example, because I think these are really helpful. If I look at two people and they start investing their money and they both put in $10,000. One person is getting a 7% interest rate and the other person is getting an 8% interest rate. And then we look at how much money they have gotten in interest after a year or two. It's gonna be like maybe a couple hundred bucks, if that, probably less. And so you could look at that and see, ah, uh, see, not a significant difference. But if you look at it over 40 years, it is going to be a huge difference. That 1% difference in interest probably is going to lead to like a doubling or tripling of money is my guess. And so again, it's a lifetime exposure sort of thing. Yeah, differences in LDL cholesterol may not make a difference over a year or two years or even five years, but if you look out 10, 20, 30 years, it definitely makes a difference. What do we need to establish causation? Well, one, we need to show that there is a link. There is absolutely a link. If you look at epidemiology, people who have higher levels of LDL tend to have higher levels of heart disease. And you see that with the Framingham study. People say, well, you know, that, that neglects HDL and inflammation. No, no, no. In the Framingham study, it doesn't matter if you have low inflammation or high inflammation or low HDL or high HDL. If you stratify those amongst people who have low inflammation and high HDL, for example, if you then separate out people who have low inflammation, high HDL, then of that subsection who has low LDL versus high LDL, the people with high LDL still have a higher risk of heart disease. That's with low inflammation and low HDL. That is what we call an independent risk factor. So the link is there. And we see that in the cohort studies as well. Is there a mechanism? Yes, we know that LDL cholesterol can penetrate the endothelium. We know that. It has been established, it has been shown repeatedly. So there's the mechanism. Do we have the randomized control trials to support it? Well, again, we talked about it's very hard to run a randomized control trial for two, three years, or even five years, which you would need, or probably more like 10 years. And so I was somebody who thought, kind of like Gary, the prevailing thinking 15 years ago, 
well, you know what? It's probably not LDL, it's the ratio of LDL to HDL. And then they came out with drugs that raised HDL. And guess what the drugs that raised HDL did? Absolutely nothing. Did not decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. HDL is just a marker of metabolic health, really not much else. However, when the Mendelian randomization trials started coming out, Mendelian randomization basically works by randomizing people based on their genetic polymorphisms. So we have some people based on genetic polymorphisms who will secrete higher LDL and some who will secrete lower LDL. So they looked at these folks over the course of their lifetime and how likely they were to develop heart disease and or die for heart disease. Did you know that it is an absolute linear effect? I, I'll never forget, there is a chart based on LDL exposure, basically showing that people who are exposed to more LDL throughout the course of their life, that there is a linear effect on the risk of heart disease. There's your randomized control trial over the course of a lifetime. That's what's great about Mendelian randomization is because it's essentially a randomized control trial over the course of people's lives. This idea that LDL is just misunderstood and picked on and misaligned and poor LDL cholesterol. No, there's actually a large body of consistent evidence to show that LDL is an independent risk factor for disease. And this shows how powerful it is. So the other thing you really need to do to show some sort of causation is a dose response. Again, we have the dose response based on the Mendelian randomization trials. And even going from like a medium or lowish level of LDL down to a lower level of LDL even further decreases the risk. So again, this is very clearly shown in this research, which Gary is either unfamiliar with or purposefully ignoring. And this research has been around since the mid 2000s. Again, when I got into grad school in the mid 2000s, right before this research came out, I was of the opinion that LDL cholesterol didn't really matter, that it was the ratio of HDL to LDL. And then over the course of the next 10 years, I actually changed my mind because enough evidence came out to show that now nah, it appears to be a independent risk factor for heart disease. Okay, that's only about a fourth of the way through this video and I'm beginning very long-winded, so let's see what else Gary has to say. All right, you have to have a corresponding increase in triglycerides, right? Not true. Once again, if we look at these studies where they show low triglyceride or high triglyceride at both of those levels, if you have low triglycerides and low LDL, you have very low risk factor. If you have low triglycerides and high LDL, you have a higher risk factor than those who have low triglycerides and low LDL. Same thing at the higher level. Again, independent risk factor, which apparently Gary doesn't quite understand. So it's actually not the amount of cholesterol in your blood, it is the size of the cholesterol molecule that yeah. the smaller cholesterol gets, the more dangerous it gets. The larger it is, the healthier it is. So the question is, how do we... He's basically saying smaller, more dense LDL particles are more atherogenic because they more easily penetrate the endothelium. That is true. Small LDL particles more easily penetrate the endothelium. They also carry less cholesterol in them. Large LDL particles do not penetrate the endothelium as easy, but they still do. And they carry more cholesterol. Do you know what the net difference is? Basically nothing. They both are equally atherogenic when you consider the amount of cholesterol that can get deposited by each. So yes, smaller particles penetrate more easily, but they carry less cholesterol. So it's less of a, a problem on a per molecule basis. Large LDL particles carry more cholesterol. So on a per molecule basis, yeah, the ones that penetrate the large LDL particles deposit more cholesterol. So again, at the end of the day, it's a wash. And again, this was some, something I used to say. This is something I used to parent. Well, it's really the size of the LDL, the oxidation status, this and that. And then you find out that when they actually compare these straight up apples to apples, it doesn't seem to really matter. So the question is, how do we drive down the size of cholesterol? Um, I'm sorry, how do we drive up the size of cholesterol? We drive down the triglyceride. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. This is an insulin issue, not a triglyceride issue. <laughs> because when insulin rises in the bloodstream, we think insulin's primary War role keto. is to block sugar. That's not true. The primary role of insulin is to block any other form of energy use in the body. If insulin is... So it doesn't block other forms of energy use. It reduces the usage of other forms of energy because yes, when you have carbohydrate into the body after you've filled glycogen out, you have to oxidize it because it can't really get stored as body fat. <gasps> Wait, what? Yeah. Less than 2% uh, of the fat that is stored in adipose tissue originates as carbohydrate. They have the metabolic tracer studies to show this. So yeah, you have to oxidize it. 
but it also doesn't wind up in fat tissue, which uh, uh, Gary just happened to miss that part. It's how you cannot burn fat. It includes fat in the blood. People that eat the most sugar have the highest blood fat. So we're gonna bring insulin down, lower the triglyceride, increase the size of cholesterol, and that will be a marker for longevity, not for living too short. You know, if you say something confidently enough, and with enough bravado and enough marketing dollars behind you, a room of people will believe you. A certain amount of people will believe you. This is such a normal, straight down the line, low carb dogma, which I don't know why the low carb community has gotten behind this. Like you can still promote a high fat, low carb diet without basically trying to evangelize saturated fat. These two things do not have to be linked together, but for whatever reason, because I guess low carb wants to say, eat your butter, eat your bacon. Fat's not bad for you. There's no fats that are bad for you. They've had to like climb on this whole LDL is, you know, a plot by the Illuminati to get you to eat more vegetables. This guy who claims he can tell you when you can die, I just, I mean, if you believe that, once again, I own the Skyway Bridge here in Tampa. I would be willing to sell it to you because if you believe this guy, you could also be the proud new owner of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. All right, guys, hope you liked the video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll catch you next week.